Can you turn the projector on? in our congregation that we're praying for. We're praying for your healing. We're praying for your strength and your mercy. Lord God, I want to thank you for everyone who's tuned into the live stream today. Father, I pray that they would receive the nourishment and the food for their soul that they need, the encouragement, Lord God, for a very discouraging time. And Lord, you and you alone can do that. And we're worshiping you today, Father, for you are worthy. And we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And amen.
just live in cathedrals made of stone. But I know you live inside my heart. I know that it's your home. And I've seen you in the sunset, in the eyes of a stranger on the street. That's who you are to me. You're amazing, faithful. The hell's open door when I'm in. You fill me hunger for more of your mercy, your goodness. Love to the air that I breathe. That's who you are to me. That's who you are.
need you, Lord. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness. Oh, it's my sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony. I heard about the water mansion He 
has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold. Just the ladies about the angels singing. Gentlemen, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song. All the saints of God. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior, Lord, forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. He loved me ere I knew him. And oh, my love is to him. Plunge me. says the Lord Jesus how I how I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace last verse I'm so glad I'm so glad I learned to trust Jesus save your friend I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. Just the voices. Jesus, Jesus. See the church. Thank you. Welcome to the third week of our baggage series, and we're talking about casting all of our cares on Christ. And if you've not heard any of the messages, uh, you can go back to Facebook or YouTube, catch up on those. But really, the, the whole review is really, I'm going to boil it down for one sentence to you. It really is just letting go of the baggage of our life to travel freely into this life so God can work in us, through us. And there are some of us here today who've, who've been hearing for so long that things are going to get better and there's greater pastures up down the road and things will eventually turn the corner and we believe all that and we understand all that but to be honest with you we're weary and and we're losing our strength and we're we feel a little wore out now we believe that God can and we believe that God wills we believe but we don't believe we we have hope but we're losing hope uh, if that sounds like you today, I'm glad you're here. And if that sounds like you today where you believe but you're still you're struggling, you're losing hope, uh, if you're online, I'm glad that you're logged on today. Y'all, we're going to be looking at a passage where we are told that our bags should be literally cast upon Christ. And I have a few scriptures that I want to share with you before we kind of get into the three major building blocks of today's message. The Bible says in Psalm 55, 22, to cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 25, Do not worry about your life. Don't worry about what you eat or drink. Don't worry 
about your body. Don't worry about what you'll wear. For is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, the Bible says that Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me, all you who are burdened. And I will give you one thing. I will give you rest. And where we're going to kind of land today is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse, verse 7. Peter, by the way, this is the same Pete that Jesus said upon this rock up in my church. And, and the, if you grew up in Catholicism, then, then uh, Peter was the first pope in, in the Catholic church. But this is the man that God has chose out. This is the man that Jesus had brought near to him. This is the man that uh, Jesus has, had just released on the world. This was the man who preached in front of the temple on that first Pentecost after the resurrection. Thousands of people got saved. This is the guy who wrote this. By the way, this is the same guy who said, I don't know Jesus. This was the same guy who had some, some mistakes in his past. This was a dude who had baggage. This is the advice he gives us. Cast all your anxiety on Jesus for one reason. Because he... Cast all your cares on Jesus because he cares for you. Now, does God like us? Absolutely. Does God cherish us? 100%. All the time. Does God love us? Absolutely. Does God want the best for us? No doubt about it. Let's keep those truths in our mind. That God has a plan for us. And God wants the best for us. And that God will work through us. Let's keep that in our mind today. As we kind of uh, go into this message. About letting Jesus handle our problems. Instead of letting them bottle up. Instead of holding on. Do that. Let's go to him in a word of prayer. Almighty God, for too long we have been trying to control our own lives and deal with our own baggage. I want to thank you for the invitation that you give us today to cast all of our cares, all of our burdens, all of our baggage upon you. God, today, would you put us in a position to be willing to give up the things that we're wrestling with? Put us in a position to be willing to give up the things that we've been uh, dealing with and seek help in carrying our baggage from you. And I ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. And amen. Well, here we go. This is the first of three, and none of the points are too big. The first one is this. I want to give you the secret sauce of how to cast your cares upon the Lord. Here's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is humility. Humility is the center of this. Um, who, who finds the truth faster? The man who is lost and refuses to ask for directions, or the woman who is lost and chooses to ask, pull over, and ask for directions? Which one will find the truth first? Woman, is it because she's smarter? Nope. Is, is it because she has more intellect? Nope. I'm going to tell you why. Because the woman knows she's lost and she has the humility to go ask for help. It's not an issue of being smart. It's an issue of humility. The man says, I can handle this on my own. The woman says, I'm lost as a good hailstorm. Let me pull over here. Now, that might be actually a sign of, uh, of intelligence. So I, I might backtrack on that. Maybe the woman is smarter. James 4, 6 says this about the proud and the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Church, we need to be willing to ask for help with our bags. We see bags that are wearing us down. We've got to say, you know what, I've got these bags or I've got... Bl Some of our bags look like blind spots. We've got blind spots in our life that we know aren't the way they should be, but we're not paying them too much attention, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Church, we're dealing with this idea of humility. Do you have someone in your life who you love and trust enough that can tell you what areas of your life that you need to shore up. That takes a lot of trust and it takes a lot of humility. In fact, the passage we read from 1 Peter identifies something. It talks about casting our cares upon the Lord, but would you believe there's actually an antecedent to that? The Bible says this in the book of 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. That God may lift you up in due time. And then in verse 7. It says, then cast all your anxieties and worries on him because he cares for you. Church, in those two verses, which comes first? Casting our cares on the Lord or humbling ourselves? That's the rub that many of us never get about. That's the, that's the rub that many of us never see. In order to let go of our bags, we've got to be humble enough to say, you know what? I've got bags that I am not strong enough to carry. I have burdens that, that are just crushing me and they are wearing me down. And church, as you know... Um, if you've ever worked with somebody who thinks they have all the answers, it wears you out. When you work with somebody who thinks they know everything, it's, it's exhausting. If, if you have somebody that you're working with in your life, no matter what you tell them or whatever you try to advise them or whatever counsel you give them, they don't listen to 
Jack. I've often, does God ever feel that way about me? Because, Richard, lots of times I think I've got all the answers. And, God, if you would just consult me, I could tell you exactly what I need you to do. Church, never one time has God ever said, Mike, I don't know what to do. What would you want? You see, we, we love a God who, who knows everything about us, cares about us. Somehow we'll tell God, God, I know you've got a plan for my wife, uh, my life. I know you've got a plan for what you want me to do, but so do I. That's where humility comes into play. Y'all live, hey guys, is there a, a noise going on in the sanctuary? Somebody's phone or is there a toy going off? If somebody, please do me the favor and turn that off uh, near them, it's distracting. Your church, living our best life in Christ takes on an enormous amount of humility. Living a life in Christ takes us knowing that we do not have everything figured out. And church, this is something Jesus knew. He knew that we would have a hard time with humility. That's why he took on the form of a servant, a human being, the form of humility, and dying on a cross. Why? Because that is the secret sauce in dropping our bags. Jesus modeled this for us. I've heard one time, humility isn't thinking less of ourselves. It's just simply thinking of ourselves less. Here are six attributes of healthy humility that I want you to think about. Number one, you admit and acknowledge that you don't have everything all together. You admit that you've got baggage that, that you don't like, you don't want, it's beat up, it's battered, it's been with you a long time, but you don't want to let it go. So you've got to acknowledge that you don't have it all together. Number two, you know the difference between self-confidence and pride. There's nothing wrong with self-confidence. In fact, self-confidence says, I can do this. I can do this. I can. Pride doesn't say that. You see, confidence says, I can do that job. Pride says, I'm the only one who can do that job. No one else can do it. That's the difference between confidence and pride, just as a, uh, a, an easy way to remind it. Number three, here's the, six, here, here's the third attribute of a healthy humility for you to think about. Number three. You seek to add value to others. You want to lift other people up. You want to, to help other people look good and feel good and things like that. Next, you take responsibility for your actions. It's not your alcoholic father's fault. It's not your creepy uncle's fault. It's not because you didn't have that opportunity that somebody else had. It's not your wife's fault. It's not your fault. I mean, it's, it's not your wife's fault. It's not your kid's fault. Y'all, just take responsibility for the baggage that you have because here's the thing. Nobody else is going to do it. The bags belong to you. Maybe somebody gave them to you, but they belong to you. Next, you understand the shadow side of success. Uh, oftentimes, if you do well and you get some success and you've got good numbers up on the board, you can get overconfident. You can think, well, I can do anything. I can do everything. That's overconfidence. Another thing, the shadow side of success uh, you get arrogant. You can have expectations. You can think, well, you know what? I did this last year. I can do better this year. And next year we think, well, I did that last year and I can do it better this year. Uh, and we kind of get this whole idea that we've got to encore. We've got to do something else and better and, and, and things like that. But I'm going to tell you what's wrong with that. If I'm saying I can do it better next year, I've got a better plan, I've got a better strategy, it's all about me. It's not about him. What's God want? What's God? What's God say on this? And lastly, you're filled with gratitude for what you have. I may not have a lot, but God, what I have, I'm happy to have. Where did you see yourself on that list? Which one of those six do you really need to tweak and, and, and call in and try to deal with? Where do you feel like you could grow in humility in these six? Okay, so once we've got the humility thing all lined up, and you know where you need some assistance in dealing with your baggage, here's the next step. The second thing is this, throw it all on Jesus. What exactly does that look like? How does that work, Mike? What does it look like when I put my, my, my anxiety and my baggage on Christ? What does it look like when I, I give that to him? The Bible says in Luke 10, 38 through 42, and Jesus and his disciples were on their way. We're about to see Mary and Martha come into the picture. He came to a, 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 a village, Bethany, I believe, where a woman named Martha opened up her home. Church, say Martha. And when I say Martha, I want you to think Stuart. She's got all the place decorations. All the napkins are folded perfectly. She's got a, whatever a quiche is baking in the oven. It's beautifully set. All the fine, fine out. Martha's opened up her home to Jesus and, and the disciples. Martha had a sister called Mary 
who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and said, um, Lord, <laughs> you see my sister over there. She'd wipe her brow. Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to come help me. And this is what Jesus said. Martha Stewart, Martha Stewart. You're worried and upset about many things. You're worried about napkins. You're worried about placemats. You're worried about if the floor looks okay. You're worried to make sure that all the dust is off the pictures. Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about so much stuff that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It doesn't make any difference. But only one thing is needed, and Mary has got it. Mary has chosen what is better. And these next couple of words are what I really want you to see. And it will not be from her. It won't be what? You find a close spot to Jesus. And you hear him speak to you and he reveals his heart to you. Church, you have a private moment with Jesus and he gives you a smooth word. He gives you a right now word, a word that's placed in your heart for the moment. Listen to me. The devil and the world can't take away what Jesus has given to you. Not your salvation, not your hope, not your peace, not your joy. None of that. Your citizenship in heaven, who you are in the family of God. The devil wants to tell you that it can be removed. But Jesus is saying nobody can take that from you. Church. There are two examples in this pa passage. There's Mary and there's Martha Stewart. In this one, I don't want to be Martha Stewart. I want to be Mary because she found the thing that cannot be taken away. So watch Mary's teaching to us. Number one, make time to set with Jesus. You pray to Jesus. Read his word. Get with him. Walk with him. If you're worried and bothered about something, tell Jesus. Set at his feet and tell him. This discipline was even modeled by Jesus. The idea of, of just getting alone with the Father and telling him what's on your heart. This is what the Bible says in Matthew 14 23 after Jesus had dismissed the multitude of the crowd he went up on the mountainside by himself when evening came he was there alone now church there are several other places in the New Testament where we see Jesus went away to pray alone it's in Mark 1 35 it's in Luke 15 it's in Luke 9 all the time Jesus is going to be alone with the Father church we need to understand that any time we spend with Jesus is time well spent whether you're in your car any time you spend with Jesus is time well spent. And no one can take that away from you. Church, what we can do this week is we can have more intentional time with Christ. Spend time in His Word. Spend time in prayer. Because the matter is, you know, COVID has done something for this church. When this church started in 1937, FDR was the president. Pearl Harbor had not happened. World War II had not happened. But in 1937, at 719 State Street, God placed First Baptist Church of Chester on this little ground to do, on this little piece of ground to do one thing, and that's to be an example of God's glory in the 62233. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens over 84 years of being a church. We do things and we begin to worship the program. Oh, we can't change this. Uh, this is the way it's always been. Mom and Paul did this, and Papa and Mama did that. But see, here's what COVID has done for us. Lots of times we as a church, we want to pause thing because we think things, this thing will clear out and things will go back to normal. So we've just pushed pause. Things will eventually go back to the way things used to be. So we just pushed pause. But COVID has not pushed pause on this church. What COVID has done is pushed reset on this church. We've not done Sunday school, discipleship, We've not done fellowships. We've not done special events in a year, March. That's not a pause. We're resetting. And can I tell you something? That's a good thing. Because what we have to do is we're going to have to build a foundation that, on a foundation, it was built in 1937, but church, we're about to build a foundation that is geared up for the next, for the next 84 years. We're building upon what's already happened. That's why you're hearing about things... That's why you're hearing about things like prayer ministry. Everything that we're doing right now, guys, is a result of we have pressed the, well, COVID has done it for us. COVID has pushed the reset button, and we will minister different 
to Chester from this point out. In fact, if you do me a favor, this is really not the message, but what we have is, uh, if you have your phone with you today, we're doing a survey. Because I want you to know, I want to hear what your thoughts are with the Connect Groups, what we do next uh, in March with the Connect Groups. But we've got a survey online. If you've got your phone today, you can, you can, uh, you can scan that. It'll take you straight to it. We've got a, uh, Reggie, help me. What's the name of that code over there, buddy? A Q- it's a QR code. You can scan it with your camera. We've got one there, and we have one out there. It's just five simple questions, but we want to know when you want to meet and what time you want to meet and what, how would you would like to do that. You can help us out with that. I tell you this because I want you to understand that, church, we have not pushed pause. We've pushed reset, and we're going forward uh, because the thing is God has not closed our doors. So I've got to assume that our mission has not changed since 1937. We're still here at this spot for one reason, and that's showing the glory of God to the 62233. That mission has not changed. How we're going to do it definitely has. And, and, and I'm glad you're along to, uh, to do this. All right, let's, let's end this thing. Let's go to the third point. Maybe it's the second point. Trust him. How long does it take you to trust somebody? Somebody comes into your life, does it take a good bit? It does me too. Takes me a little bit of time. Somebody I meet because you, you got to see how they interact. You got to see how they think, and if they're a go-getter or not a go-getter. If they're, a, you know, they're all talk or or they can back it up. It takes us a, a, a little while to to uh, to gain somebody's correct, uh, trust. Uh, Ringo Starr used to uh, to sing, "It don't come easy." Trust doesn't always come easy. Um, in his book entitled "The Speed of Trust," Stephen Covey wrote, "Low trust causes friction." And in organizations, low trust creates hidden agendas, politics, interpersonal conflict, win losing thinking, defensive and protective communication, all which reduce the speed of trust. Low trust slows everything, every decision, every communication, and every relationship. Church, if we can't trust God, it will slow our process down in growth. If we can't trust God with our life, it will slow the way we grow in the kingdom of God down. Have you experienced low trust in your life and seen the damage that it's done in your life and in your relationships? Covey goes on to say this. Simply put, trust means confidence. The opposite of trust is suspicion. Church, let me ask you a question. And please don't answer this out loud. Have you ever been suspicious of God? God, are you really going to help me? Are you really going to come through for me? Are you really going to do this in my life? Simply put, simply put, sometimes we can get suspicious of God. Are you waiting on Him to drop the hammer on you? Are you waiting for Him to come up and punish you? Are you waiting for God to come up and reprimand you because you did something wrong? Are you waiting for God to take something good away from you because you dropped the ball? (laughs) That's not my God. Let me tell you what the Bible says about our God. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. It doesn't say plans for you to be ruined and plans for you to be sick and plans for you to be poor and plans for you to be miserable and plans for you to be burdened and plans for you to be, to be, uh, to be wore out. No, no, no. That's not what the plan is. Plans to prosper you, plans to not harm you, plans to give you hope, plans to give you a future. Church, I want you to know two things. He has a plan for our lives, and you will also experience trouble. He's got a plan for your life, and you're also going to have hard times. He's got a plan for your life, and you're also going to be frustrated. He has a plan for your life, but you're also going to to be wore out. Church, I'm going to tell you what. No one can avoid these things, but there is a promise that we get to enjoy as sons of God, no matter what kind of hell or valley we're going through. The Bible says this. We know that in what kind of things? Does he work in cancer? Does he work in divorce? Does he work in bankruptcy? Does he work in being fired? Does he work in what we're going through right now? Absolutely, because the Word of God says that God causes all things works for the good of those who love God, who've been called according to His purpose. The worst day of your life can be used for the glory of God if you just turn it over to Him. I want to tell you how I learned to do that. It's just a simple illustration. But you know, if you look at a piece of music and you're a trained musician... You see the first measure of the song at the same time you see the last measure of the song. I know that this song is going to start with a D, 
And I know that it's going to end with a D. Why? Because I can see. I can see the first measure and the last measure. I know how many lines are in the song. I know what the middle part sounds like. I know what the middle eight sounds like. I, I see it all. Um, you can choose to play the first measure. You can skip down to the 12th measure. It doesn't matter because it's all right there in front of you. If you've ever been in band, you've got your sheet of music in front of you, but the brass have another set of music, the woodwinds have another set of music, the percussion has another set of music, and even within them, there's, you know, there's, there's different levels of this instrument and that instrument and, and things like that. But as you're playing the piece, there's a conductor up front, and he's keeping track and keeping time of everything that's going along. He's keeping track of where everybody's at on the page, and he sees where we're going all at the same time. He sees where we've been at the same time. And if you're watching him, he will cue you when you come in, and he'll cue you on when you slow down and when you get loud and when you get soft. But the conductor sees it all, and he's controlling it all. And all I can see right now is the music in front of me and me going from one measure to the next. Church. When God, the beautiful conductor of our life, comes into our life, this is what happens. He sees our whole life all at the same time. From the moment of conception, our first breath in our mother's womb, to the point of our last breath, God sees it all. And He sees the beginning as well as He sees the end. There's no obstructions in how God sees your life and my life. There is nothing that stops Him. Church, God knows our past, our present, and our future all at the same time. God knows our beginning and God knows our end and everything in between. And like a good conductor, he sees our lives laid out like a musical score and nothing surprises him. He knows where the awkward rests are. He knows where the weird notes belong. We, on the other hand, experience life like an audience gathered to hear the concert. If you're in the audience and you hear the conductor and you hear the band, you don't see the music in front of you. You're just going along for the rise. Oh, this is awesome. It's good. Everybody up there is following the conductor and following the music. Everybody in the audience is saying, oh, this is nice. I like this. Church, when we come to God, when you and I come to God, we experience life like an audience gathered to hear the concert one note at a time. But church, rather than worrying about which note is next, all we do in the audience is we just conduct, we, we trust the conductor and he presents everything to us. Church, the Bible says that Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Church, I'm going to just take my bags to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know every part of my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You were there the moment I started, and you'll be there the moment I end, and you'll be there for every moment beyond that. I'm just going to trust you with it because you see everything at the same time. Church, trust Him today. Cast your cares on Him today. Toss your baggage on to Jesus and walk a little lighter this afternoon. Y'all, I want you to think for a moment. If God didn't care about you, would he have sent Jesus to die in your place? If God didn't care about you, would he offer you the free gift of salvation? If Jesus didn't care about you, would have he have humbled himself to the point of death on the cross for you? Is Peter, who spent years with Jesus out on a mission field, out in his ministry, whom Jesus trusted to lead the disciples in his earthly absence? This is the same Peter. Do you think he'd be misleading us when he says, hey guys, I know it's rough out there. So cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust old Pete, too, because he's speaking the words of God. So church today, let go of suspicion. Let go of doubt. Let go of the baggage. Trust Jesus with your life today and every day hereafter. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Almighty God, today, we come to you, and we want to thank you so much for the privilege and the honor. The privilege and the honor of being able to just simply cast our cares and baggage to you. And Lord, I pray for those who are in this room today who've never received you as Lord and Savior. I pray for those who don't know whether if they would die today, they would spend an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. As every eye is bowed and every head, every, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Today, if you don't know where you'd spend eternity, I just, I, I want to walk you through that. Maybe you're a born-again Christian, but you just need some reaffirmation in your faith. You, to, uh, you just want to reaffirm that decision as every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. I believe you died on a cross in my place to save me, to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, today, I confess my sin to you 
and profess you as my Savior. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Now, if that's the first time you've ever said that prayer, it's the first time you've ever asked Jesus into your life, this is the first time you have surrendered yourself to him, would you just simply lift your hand? You can put it right back down. You've never done that before. You can just put it up and right back down. Okay. Church, I'm going to ask you if you would to simply stand. The unfit band is going to sing us a song. And we're going to worship with them. Then in a moment, I'm going to come right back to the invitation. But, man, if you need to pray this morning, this invitation is open to you right now. If you need somebody to pray with you, this invitation is open right now. If you just feel a need for, for, for a fresh anointing, the invitation is open right now. As we sing. This week we have we've kind of ended things just literally turning it over to him. Some of you have some pain in your life that, that you've adopted. You've got failure in your life that is living in your mind and in your heart rent free. Somehow it's convinced you that you have to keep them as a tenant in your mind. That you cannot evict them. But church, as long as you have despair and defeat and discouragement taking up residency in your mind and in your heart, it's going to be really hard to be more than a conqueror. It's going to be really hard to be the disciple of Jesus. It's going to be really hard to live in victory. So church, I want you to think about all those past mistakes and faults and, and errors and, and humiliations and, and embarrassments and, and hurt and rejection and pain and abuse. Things that you've been carrying for so long. You're exhausted by them. They manifest in your life. They affect your relationships. They affect your marriage. They affect your trust. They affect the relationship with your children. That is not God's plan for you and me. That is not God's plan for us. Today, maybe you're carrying that pain. Today's the day to drop it. Today, you've been carrying this mistake. Today's the day to drop it. Whether it was caused by you or you were a victim. Jesus has peace for you. He is the way maker. He's the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. And today would you let him be your baggage remover. In a moment we're going to continue to sing. But today if you just in a very, in a very real way. If you just want to make your way to the front. And just stand. And in a moment, I'll just ask you to lift your hands up here at the front. And we're just going to turn things over to God. We're just going to turn things over to God. So as we continue to sing, this morning, if you would just like to turn all that, all of that baggage over to God, I'm just going to ask you to come up to the front, and then I'll lead you from that point on. Almighty God, as we go into this extended invitation, Lord, let me be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. And Lord God, if, if you're going to do something, I, I ask you to do it now. If you're going to call a lost person to salvation, Almighty God, would you do it now? Lord God, if you're going to call people to 
drop baggage of pain, hurt, would you do it now, Lord? Waymaker, promise keeper, light in the dark, light in the darkness, my God, that is you. Would you come right now? I'm not going to keep you much longer, I promise. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Almighty God, I love you. Thank you so much for the folks that have come out to worship today, Lord. And we love you. You are so good to us beyond measure. Thank you for being the God that takes our baggage off of us. Thank you for being the God who works through baggage. And Lord God, today I claim victory over every house and every family. And Father, I pray that we would go forward in this race uninhibited and unhindered, unchained, free to pursue your heart. It's in your name that I pray, and amen. Y'all, thank you for coming. I'm going to go to the back. Rhonda, you're going to go out first, and do me a favor, church. Make sure that before you leave, the row behind you is dismissed. We'll start with Rhonda back there in Newcomer Corner, and we'll just work our way forward.